Okay, good morning, everybody. Thank you so very much for joining us for another edition of the Green Thumb Gardening Series with the Texas A&M AgriLife Extensions Office and the Harris County Master Gardeners. My name is Brian, and I'm with the Harris County Public Library, and we are very excited for you to be with us today as our Master Gardener, Deborah Caldwell, presents Gardening for Beginners. So before we start, just a little bit of housekeeping. Please remember to like and share today's video, and please ask lots of questions in the chat. Throughout the program, we'll pause occasionally and ask a few questions live on air. Uh, we also have other Harris County Master Gardeners answering questions in the chat. So if we don't get to your question on air, please keep an eye on the post afterwards because all the Master Gardeners will go through and try to answer as many questions as they can after the program is done. Today's video is being recorded. And in fact, and you can watch all of our old Green Thumb Master Green Thumb Garden Series videos at any time on the library's Facebook page or on our YouTube channel. So if you need to go back and watch anything, they're all there ready for you at any time. So I think that's about it. Let's go ahead and bring Deborah on. And Deborah, good morning. Good morning, Brian. I know we've got a big program today, so I'm going to let you go ahead and take off. And everybody, please remember to ask lots of questions in the chat, and we'll be uh, getting back soon to some questions. So Deborah, here you go. Thank you, Brian. Let's go to the next slide to take a look at the Green Thumb schedule. And you can see we have two more talks coming up. Permaculture is the topic in September, and then we'll be talking about plant propagation in October. All right, let's go to the next slide. Um, I'm a master gardener in Harris County, Texas. Uh, some of what we talk about today will apply to our local gardening, but I think even if you live somewhere else, you'll find a lot of good information. Um, I do wanna give you some resources as we go through the presentation. Uh, don't panic, you don't have to copy them all down because uh, other master gardeners will be putting links to some of these um, resources in the comments section. Uh, but let's start by pointing out a couple of really good resources, uh, both AgriLife Extension for Harris County and also the Harris County Master Gardeners. Okay, let's go to the next slide, please. Um, gardening is a huge topic, which we can't cover in just an hour. Um, but what we would like to do today is to introduce some of the basics of successful gardening. As I mentioned, we're going to give you a lot of resources. Uh, to help answer the questions that you'll inevitably have. And we wanna give you some advice about how you can get started. So let's go ahead and just start with the basics. Next slide, please. And uh, I wanna give you a mnemonic that will help you remember what plants need. And if you keep those in mind, it should help you grow your plant successfully. So remember P-L-A-N-T-S. Uh, P stands for a place because plants need a place to live in a container or a garden bed. They need light, air, nutrients. Plants are thirsty, they need water, and they need soil or some other medium for growing roots. Let's go to the next slide. And you'll see uh, that we're going to start at the bottom with soil because it's literally the foundation of gardening. Um, Soil is a dynamic living ecosystem, and it consists of about 45% disintegrated rock. These are providing the minerals. Um, rock goes through the process of weathering. Physical, chemical, biological processes break down the rock into smaller and smaller pieces. About 25% of soil is water. Another 25% is air. And then that last little percentage is made up of organic matter. And it can range from as low as about five tenths of a percent up to about 5% of organic matter or even more. And that consists of humus, which is the dead decomposing material, as well as living organisms that make up the soil community. So let's go to the next slide and talk about soil texture. As we mentioned, weathering is going to break that rock down into smaller and smaller pieces. Um, if you have very, very tiny particles uh, that you could still see with the naked eye, um, maybe up to about two millimeters in diameter, we call that sand. Even smaller particles are called silt 
and the tiniest particles that are less than two thousandth of a millimeter in diameter are called clay. You need a powerful microscope to see clay. Um, now these different soil particles are going to comprise the soil texture, which affects a number of factors like drainage, water holding ability, aeration, workability, nutrient holding, and so on. So for example, if you have the larger sand particles, they have fairly um, big pore spaces in between them. And as a result, water passes through sand pretty quickly. It doesn't hold onto water very well. Uh, it has good aeration, good workability, uh, but not very good nutrient holding. Clay, on the other hand, has all of those tiny little particles packed very close together, and um, it doesn't have much pore space, so clay doesn't drain well. It holds on to water, in fact, sometimes too well, doesn't have good aeration, kind of horrible workability, uh, but one good thing about clay is that it does hold on to nutrients quite well. Unfortunately, many of us in our area do have heavy clay soil. So let's go to the next slide and talk about doing a soil test. The soil test can provide information about what kind of texture you have, as well as uh, nutrient levels and other characteristics of the soil. Um, so here's some different references that you can go to to get more information. You can see the um, link to the soil testing lab at the bottom of the slide. Um, you can um, go there to get uh, information sheets um, as well as the um, sheet that you mail in. And that sheet does have some information about how to collect samples. But if you've never done that before, what I recommend is that you go to the link on number two which has um, an article that gives you much more information about how to collect samples. But it's still a fairly easy process and you can get your samples together, mail them away, pay a small fee, and in a relatively short amount of time, you will have information about your soil. Uh, the most basic soil test costs only $12 and it will reveal things like pH and um, macronutrient levels. Even the super duper test, which gives you the routine analysis plus micro nutrient levels plus texture is $39. And really, I think in the long run, you'll save money by doing a soil test because you won't waste money on unnecessary fertilizers or amendments. And of course, your plants will thank you because you'll be helping to amend the soil to provide what they need. So don't guess soil test. Let's go to the next slide and talk about some ways that you could improve your soil. And the secret is to add organic matter. So if you have that heavy clay soil, for example, or sand or some uh, less than ideal texture, uh, you can add organic matter to help improve soil texture and nutrient levels. Um, humus is the decomposed dead stuff that makes up the organic matter in soil. And it includes things like twigs and leaves and so on that fall from the plants. Uh, it might include waste, uh, decomposing organisms like the little dead roly polies and so on. And uh, by adding organic matter to the soil, you can improve water retention, drainage, workability, and so on. Uh, so for example, if you do have that heavy clay soil, the little bits of organic matter will help push aside those tiny clay particles and improve aeration and drainage. Um, if you have sandy soil, on the other hand, the organic matter acts like little sponges and helps soak up the um, water and improve retention. Many of us have um, clay soil. Uh, the ideal, ideal soil is called loam, and it's a combination of about 40% sand, 40% silt, and 20% clay. But if you don't have that magic loam, you can still improve soil by adding organic matter. Let's go to the next slide, and you'll see um, a picture of the soil community of living things, and you'll see that the base of that soil food web is the humus or the organic matter. It's going to provide food for the FBI, the fungi, bacteria, and invertebrates that go through the decomposition of the organic matter and make the nutrients available. 
and those in turn feed other organisms and so on. If you have a really good, rich soil, you'll find that um, you have a very extensive and abundant uh, number of organisms. In fact, um, in a square meter of good soil, you'd probably see at least one vertebrate, like a mole or something, um, hundreds of invertebrates um, like snails, slugs, earthworms, uh, insects, um, as well as millions of other tiny, tiny invertebrates and trillions of single-celled organisms if you give them the organic matter they need to eat. Um, so you might have heard the saying, feed the soil, not the plant, uh, because the soil community is so vital for plant health. So let's go to the next slide and talk about how we can kind of jumpstart this process. Uh, we can make our own compost to add organic matter to the soil, and as it decomposes, it will eventually form humus. Uh, so we can start by collecting dead leaves, kitchen scraps, and other organic material. Now on the next slide, let's take a look at um, kind of a recipe for making compost. Um, you need browns, greens, air, and water. So let's talk a little bit more about those. The browns are going to provide carbon and you could use things like dry leaves or straw, uh, pine straw or pine needles, rice hulls, things like that, even dried out grass. Um, the greens provide nitrogen. Uh, these could be things like um, food waste, although be sure you don't add any kind of meat or other animal products. Uh, you could use fresh grass clippings. Um, even coffee grounds are considered to be greens. Um, and then what I typically do is I'll layer. So I'll have a layer of brown. I'll add some soil because that's where the FBI are. And then a layer of green, more soil to add those decomposers, brown soil, green soil, and so on. Um, until I have a pile that's about at least three by three by three feet. You want it to be at least that big in order uh, to retain moisture and um, it will actually start to heat up as the decomposition process goes on. Um, I stir everything up uh, pretty frequently to add lots of air for the decomposers and of course they need water. And you want your um, compost pile to be about as moist as a wrung out sponge. For more information about composting, you can go back to the Green Thumb Talk on composting um, that was um, given back in April, if you'd like to learn more about the process. So let's go to the next slide and talk a little bit about uh, nutrients that plants need. This would include the macronutrients, micronutrients, and um, trace elements. The macronutrients are the big three, the uh, NPK, which stands for nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. But in addition, plants need secondary nutrients in smaller amounts, and these could be things like calcium and sulfur. And then they even need a little tiny bit of uh, trace elements like copper, zinc, boron, and so on. Um, I can remember when I took soil science at the university, we did experiments with plants where we gave them everything they needed except for one of the micronutrients or trace elements, and they struggled. They often um, didn't survive without that tiny bit of uh, the nutrient that they needed. So let's take a look um, at the next slide and talk about how we could add nutrients, and we could use some sort of fertilizer. Um, and they fall into two basic categories. We have synthetic fertilizers and organic fertilizers. Synthetic fertilizers are made from chemicals and organic inorganic materials. Um, you can see a sample, um, the blue material that I'm holding there. Uh, many of these are water soluble, so you mix them with water. And this is a case where more is not better you want to follow the directions precisely because if you apply um, one of these synthetic fertilizers that's too concentrated, you can burn your plants. Um, so be sure you read the labels. Um, they really pack a punch and they often do release the nutrients very quickly. Um, although there are some synthetic fertilizers that are slow release. 
So let's go ahead and look at the next slide to talk about organic fertilizers. And we've already mentioned compost. Uh, other organic fertilizers would include things like bone meal, blood meal, well-aged manures. Um, and they have the advantage not only of providing nutrients that your plants might need, but as we mentioned, they can also improve um, soil texture and they can provide food for all those little soil organisms. Um, in general, organic fertilizers are lower in nutrients and because they may have to decompose a little bit, the nutrients might not be available quite as quickly. Uh, I see someone had a question about pine needles and yes, they can be um, a type of organic fertilizer, um, but I would compost them first to make sure they're pretty well broken down. Okay, let's go to the next slide and talk about um, another way that you can deal with soil problems, and that is to simply rise above it uh, by using containers or raised beds. And there are many different kinds available. You can build them out of wood, um, cinder blocks, or on the, the next picture, you'll see the craziest one I've ever seen, which was made out of bowling balls and old wine bottles. Um, but this way you can add your own good mix of potting soil and um, provide the nutrients and texture that you might need and avoid problems uh, that you might be having with poor soil. Okay, so let's go to the next slide and talk about the fact that plants need a place to live. And what you want to do, of course, is put the right plant in the right place at the right time of year. So it's a great idea before you plant anything to take time to observe your environment um, over a period of time. Um, and you may discover that you have different microclimates in your yard. Um, maybe there's a corner under a tree that tends to stay fairly wet and shady while the area next to your driveway is hot and dry and sunny. Um, and you'll find that you don't put the same plant in both places. You'd want to find plants that are best suited to that microclimate. Uh, we've talked about soil. Uh, you want to know what zone you're in, which we'll talk about. And we're also going to talk more about light. So take time to actually get out there over a period of time, several seasons, and find out what's happening in your yard. An area might be quite sunny right now and then uh, be in shade in the winter or vice versa. Maybe you'll find that you have um, a spot under deciduous trees that's pretty shady now, uh, but when the trees lose their leaves, it might be quite sunny. So let's go to the next slide and talk more about light because different types of plants require different levels of exposure to light. So if you look at a label, you'll probably see an icon or perhaps words that indicate um, the best location and light requirements. Uh, and a plant that needs sun or full sun uh, should be in direct sun for six to eight hours or more per day. If you see the words part sun or light shade, the plants are going to require three to four to six hours of direct sun per day. And they're going to do best if they're getting afternoon sun. They'll probably uh, be more productive, have more flowers and so on if you give them uh, some afternoon sun. Plants that uh, require partial or filtered shade still need about three or four to six hours of sun per day but they're probably gonna benefit from having some protection in the afternoon from the really harsh, hot afternoon sun. So they'll probably do better if you put them in an area where they get their uh, sunlight during the morning. And then finally, some plants like the shade. Uh, they need less than three hours of direct sun per day. Um, and there are quite a few plants that do well under those conditions, things like ferns or a uh, gold dust plant or um, mahonias also do well in the shade. I have two or three huge oak trees that own my yard, so I garden in the shade for the most part. Let's go to the next slide, though, and talk a little bit about the fact that um, there are regional differences, of course, and uh, sun intensity can have a big impact on light requirements. So you may find that a plant that needs 
full sun, according to the label, uh, actually will wither in our hot Texas sun. Um, so it's a good idea uh, to check with the staff at your local nursery or um, plant um, center. Uh, they may give you more advice about what um, the light requirements actually are in our area and uh, maybe give you some advice about plants that would do well in uh, various light conditions. Okay, so let's move on now to another thing that plants need, which is water. And one question we often hear is, um, how often should I water my plants? A basic rule of thumb is that established plants like uh, trees and shrubs, uh, lawn, uh, even a vegetable garden needs about one inch of water per week. Now that can be from rain, irrigation, or some combination. Um, so the uh, amount of water though really depends on a wide variety of factors, including uh, temperature, humidity, uh, type of soil, as we've already mentioned, type of plant, age of the plant. So if you have, for example, um, a tiny seedling growing in sandy soil in the hot sun, it's going to need frequent watering, maybe even twice a day um, when it's very young. But a more mature shrub in a shady area in clay soil wouldn't need the frequent watering. One thing to remember is that um, if you have plants in a container or a raised bed, <clears throat> they tend to drain and dry out more quickly. Uh, and the smaller the container is, the more quickly it will dry out. So we advise people to go big if you can. Uh, the bigger the container, the better. Let's go to the next slide and talk about uh, drip irrigation. Um, you can see some uh, drip tubing uh, in the vegetable bed in the photo. And drip irrigation has a couple of advantages. One is it helps conserve water because you're not spraying water everywhere, including your driveway. Um, it's going to deliver water directly to the plant roots. And um, it also helps keep water off the leaves. There's some plants that don't appreciate having wet leaves. Uh, it can lead to fungal problems and the uh, sun can, the water droplets can act like little lenses and concentrate the sun's energy and actually burn holes in the leaves. Uh, so drip irrigation, if you can set it up, and there are kits that are fairly easy to use, uh, drip irrigation will help you apply water directly to the plants. Another uh, thing to think about is hydrozoning, <clears throat> where you're grouping plants with similar water needs in the same area. So I might group all of my really thirsty plants in one spot, pretty close to the water source, and then uh, put the more drought tolerant plants farther away. And that way we can adjust the amount of water those plants are receiving and again, help conserve water. So let's go on now and talk a little bit. Um, well, actually, let's look at the next slide. Yes, so this is probably a good place to answer some questions. So let me go over the list that we see. Yeah, we've got a few that I, I posted. I can I can read them off to you if you like. Um, so we have a question from- I can from... see them, yeah. Oh, you can um, see them? Okay, yeah. Yeah, Sarah Paul wants to ask about invasive flathead worms. Do we have any info on that? Uh, those are a type of, um, well, they belong to Phylum platyhelminthes, which is probably more than you really want to know. But yes, they are a huge problem, and you do not want to chop them up because each piece will grow into a new flatworm, potentially. Uh, so better to uh, put them in a plastic bag, uh, throw them in the trash, chop them up, or not chop them up, but drown them. Um, so uh, you can go online and, and probably find pictures of those so you know what they look like. One problem is that they do um, kill er earthworms. Mm -hmm. um, so hopefully you won't see them. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. And then I see a question about watering, which is yeah. uh, perfect for what we were just discussing. Um, you need to um, make sure that the plant is really soaked to the point that water is running out of the bottom of the pot. Mm -hmm. um, and you may need to break up the soil. 
sometimes a uh, soil mix will have something like peat in it. And once peat dries out, it's very hard to get wet again and the soil will just run off the surface. So you might really need to get in there with your fingers and break up the soil. And then, as I said, water very, very thoroughly to make sure water's running out the bottom. I think we answered the question about pine needles. Mm -hmm. And uh, I see a question about our growing zone, the intense sun, the torrential rains. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we are going to talk more about timing. So okay. we'll get to that in just a little bit. Perfect. So I think that's a great we'll move on. Uh, but please continue to ask some more questions. Put them in the chat and our master gardeners are, are slowly answering the questions too on the page. So thank you, everybody. And we'll uh, keep on going. OK, so. Um, as you're getting started, um, take time to think about your goal in gardening. Uh, do you want to have um, edibles, uh, vegetables and fruits that can feed your family? Um, do you want a lot of color in your yard? Um, do you want to provide habitat for wildlife? Um, I think there's a tendency for beginning gardeners to um, really bite off more than they can chew. So before you go out and plow up the back 40 and try to recreate Versailles, let's go to the next slide to see what the experienced gardeners recommend. And they say start small. Um, so it's much better to garden a small space well rather than garden a large space poorly. So if you are just starting out, you might want to just start with a few containers or maybe just one raised bed. And then as you gain experience, of course, you can add more and more. Um, but it's a great idea to just start slowly, get the experience, and then you can move forward and, and add more as you move along. Let's go to the next slide. I want to give you um, a couple of really good resources that will help you as you get started. Uh, the top one is just planning a garden in general. Um, and the other one is specific for vegetable gardening. Uh, but both of these um, are articles that will give you a lot more information about uh, making a plan and getting started. So let's go to the next slide. And what I recommend is that you uh, sit down with a pencil and, uh, pencil and paper, or there are some uh, websites that will help you with uh, planning a garden. And what you want to do is show the location and spacing of plants. And be sure that you're keeping in mind their mature size, because there's nothing worse than putting a bunch of plants very close together, and then you discover that they get quite large, and you have to pull some out. Um, also keep in mind that as you're planning your garden, you can put um, plants on the north side of the garden if they're going to be very tall, or you could use trellises. Uh, vertical, garden is, vertical gardening is a great way to use your space. Another thing you can do is to maximize your space by um, putting small or very fast growing plants in between the bigger slow growing plants. So for example, you could have a vegetable bed where you put in some cabbages, um, but they take time to grow. So you could plant a few radish seeds in between. They're going to grow very quickly and you can probably harvest in three or four weeks as the cabbages are taking their time and growing bigger. Or maybe you're putting in um, a flower garden with some perennials Again, they might take two or three years to reach their full size. And in the meantime, you could put a lot of annuals in between. So let's go to the next slide and talk a little bit about tools. One advantage of starting pretty small is that you won't need too many tools. Uh, basically, you would need a trowel or a plant knife for digging, uh, maybe some kind of weeding tool, or again, a, a plant knife for weeding. I love my plant knife because I can use it for both. Um, gloves are a great idea because remember those trillions of bacteria in the soil? Uh, you may want some containers and also a hose and nozzle or a watering can. And it's a, a great idea to keep your um, beds as close to the watering source as possible so you're not dragging a hose all over your yard. 
Then um, as you expand, of course, you might want some hand pruners, bigger tools like shovels, rakes, maybe a wheelbarrow or wagon and so on. All right, let's go to the next slide and talk about the plants. Um, should you plant seeds or is it a better idea to uh, begin with starts, which we also call transplants? So let's start with the seeds and some of their advantages. For one thing, seeds cost much less. You can get a packet of seeds for a couple of dollars and you might have a hundred seeds, potentially a hundred plants. Um, you'll find that seeds come in a huge variety. If you go to the garden center, you might see five or 10 types of tomatoes. But if you go to the seed companies or look at a seed catalog, you might see hundreds of different varieties of tomatoes. So you can get exactly what you want. You are controlling the growing conditions. Um, and in turn, you're able to control the quality of the plants. Another advantage of seeds is that the they're available, um, you'll have the kind of plant you want when you want it. Um, I find it uh, very frustrating to have a plan in mind, like maybe I wanna have some tall yellow uh, marigolds to put in the back of a flower bed, and I go to the nursery and only find short orange marigolds or no marigolds at all, and then I have to change my plan. But if I start my own seeds, I can have the plants I want when I want them. All right, let's look at the next slide to see some advantages of using transplants instead. Oh, let's go back. Yeah, there we are. Um, transplants um, will be fairly strong young plants that have probably been chosen specifically for your area. And uh, you can skip all the fuss of trying to start your own seeds. Um, so transplants are easier for beginners. And they offer the advantage of um, having gone through their life cycle already to some point so that they may already have flowers and you can get instant color or they may be much farther along in maturity. So you can put them in your veg bed and, and start getting a harvest pretty quickly. So let's look at the next slide and talk about labels because whether you start with seeds or transplants, you're going to find that there's a lot of information on the label. And if you can decode that information, it's going to make your life much easier and you'll be more successful. Um, so on a seed packet or plant tag, you're going to see the name of the plant, probably the common name, uh, maybe scientific name, variety or cultivar. Uh, they might give you information about the life cycle, light requirements. Let's go to the next slide to see the back. Um, you might uh, get information about water needs, planting and care instructions. Um, more important information would be size at maturity, uh, so you know how to space the plants. Uh, they might have uh, your zone um, or information about planting dates, and maybe even more. So be sure you read the labels because it will give you a great idea of whether it's going to be the right plant for the right place and it will help you put that plant in the ground at the right time of the year. Okay, so let's move on and talk about uh, what some of this information on the label might be telling you. It might give you information about life cycle. So plants generally are annuals, biennials, or perennials. An annual is a plant that lives for one growing season. It grows, flowers, sets seeds, and dies in just one year. A lot of our colorful flowers fall into this category, like zinnias and marigolds, and many vegetables um, are considered to be annuals as well. The next slide shows us um, an example of a biennial. Uh, they would include things like parsley and foxgloves. A uh, foxglove, for example, um, will form a kind of rosette of green leaves the first year, and then in the second year, it grows a flower spike, sets seed, and completes its life cycle. Next slide shows us some examples of perennials. Now these are plants that live for many seasons. Technically, trees, shrubs um, are perennials because they live a long time. But when we use this term, we're really referring to 
plants that we usually use for flowers, like irises, daylilies. Um, some may survive through the whole year. Uh, others may die back, like daffodils or tulips, and then they sprout and regrow the next year. Um, in our area, because we have a fairly mild climate, there are many plants that are considered to be annuals in colder climates, but they behave like perennials in our climate. Um, the photo of the pink plant, um, those are pentas. And I find that my pentas um, stay alive year after year after year. Even during the horrible freeze that we had uh, last winter, my pentas foliage did die back completely, but the roots were still alive and fairly soon sprouted again. And my pentas are as good as ever. So we're very lucky because a lot of plants that are considered to be annuals or even house plants in some parts of the country uh, will behave like perennials here. Let's look at the next slide. Uh, I keep mentioning zone and you may be wondering what that is. Um, the USDA, Department of Agriculture, has created hardiness zones based on the average annual minimum winter temperature. And uh, they have a website that's interactive. Uh, go to the website, type in your zip code to find your zone. You're going to find that uh, for most of us living in Harris County, we're in zone 9A. If you're farther to the south, you might be in 9B. If you're more to the north, you might be in zone 8B. But you'll find that many plant labels give you zones at which the plant will be able to grow best. So it might say something like zones three through eight. Well, that tells us that the plant wouldn't do well in our area. So you'd wanna look for a plant that does well in zone nine um, if you're growing here in uh, Harris County. Let's go to the next slide. And you'll see that um, the uh, AgriLife Extension has made our, your life even easier if you're trying to plant vegetables because it has this calendar available that gives you planting dates for vegetable gardens. And it lists uh, a wide variety of different vegetables and tells you when you should plant them. Um, the darker green indicates the prime time and then the lighter green are more marginal times when the plant may be okay. Um, but for best success, you'd wanna be in the dark green times. Um, and one thing that you may notice is that we really have two planting seasons. Uh, there are many plants that are going to do very well if you plant them this fall, uh, starting about mid-September or so. And then we have another big growing season in the springtime. Um, one of the hardest times of year for us, of course, is the middle of summer when it's so hot. Right now, there's hardly anything that you would want to start in the garden. But soon, very soon, we're going to have um, a chance to get our fall crops in the ground. Now, I want to go to the bottom of that calendar. You can see some blue arrows and little blue writing. Let's go to the next slide to magnify that. So there at the bottom, you can see those blue arrows and they indicate the average last and first frost dates in different parts of Harris County. It's such a big county that if you're in the more southern region in line with Hobby Airport, your last frost date is usually around February 8th. But if you're in the more northern region, the last frost date is closer to March 1st. And then in the winter, if you're in the northern part of the county, your first freeze probably will be around the end of November. But if you're in the more southern region, then you might not have a freeze until about December 20th. Well, let me point out the fact that these are averages. And once in a while, we'll have a horrible winter like we had uh, this past winter when we have an extended heavy freeze um, and all bets are off. But you can go with these frost dates up to a point, but I recommend that you also pay attention to the local weather conditions um, and adjust accordingly. Okay, let's look at the next slide and talk more about starting seeds. 
Um, a lot of seeds can go directly into the garden soil while others should be started inside. Um, on the calendar, you'll notice that they're giving dates primarily for direct seeding. Um, once in a while, you'll see an indication that uh, they recommend a different um, um, method, but for the most part, the dates that they're giving you in the calendar are for direct seeding. So let's go ahead and talk a little bit more about seeds on the next slide. You need some basic equipment. Um, you can um, start seeds indoors with, of course, the seeds, a good starting mix or potting mix. Uh, you don't want to use regular gardening, gardening soil because it can have um, spores from fun, fungi in there that will cause uh, the seeds to die. So get a good sterilized potting mix. Um, you can recycle containers from plants that you bought previously. Um, or at the bottom photo, you can see I'm using an old lettuce container. Um, and it works really well because it has a lid, um, a transparent cover. So it can be made into a little kind of mini greenhouse. You may need a heat mat. Uh, you need a good light source. You want to label everything, of course, and you also want to provide enough water. Let's go to the next slide and talk a little bit more about starting seeds in containers. Um, usually I will get a container and mix up my soil uh, mix uh, with water until it's pretty moist. Again, you want it about like um, a wrung out sponge and then plant, uh, pat that into the container and then poke a hole in the soil and put your seeds at a depth that's about twice their size. So if you have a big seed like a pea uh, or nasturtium, it might be planted a third to half an inch deep. But many seeds are very, very tiny and they will need only about a quarter of an inch or even an eighth of an inch of soil over them. Uh, some seeds like lettuce actually require light to germinate and so they should be very, very shallow with just the dusting of, of soil. Um, again, you want to make sure you label with the name, the variety, the date, and then water in your seeds uh, to help fill in the air spaces, settle the seeds, and make sure they're in contact with the soil. Okay, let's move on. Um, you may want to uh, use a heat mat, which can provide warmth for seeds like peppers, tomatoes, eggplants that you might be starting in the dead of winter. Um, if you're starting outside, you might want something like a little mini greenhouse that you see in the photo. Um, if you're growing inside, you need a good light source. Uh, you'll find that if you just try to start the seeds um, in a sunny windowsill, that's probably not enough light and they're going to stretch to try to reach the light and uh, have very weak and spindly stems. So let's go to the next slide. Now, if you've grown your seedlings successfully, after a few weeks, they'll be about two inches high and have two sets of true leaves. And at that point, you want to pot them up. And that means you're gonna move them into a bigger container. Um, what I usually do is just use a fork to gently prick the seedlings out of their um, original container. And then I put them into a larger container, usually a four inch pot, with a good potting mix and again label water them in and then i'll continue to grow them in a greenhouse or other sheltered area now obviously if you've started your seedlings in a bigger pot you can skip this step so let's move on and talk about a process called hardening off um, it's a good idea before you throw your little seedlings out into the cold, cruel world to give them a chance to kind of acclimate to outside conditions. So it's a really simple process. What you'll do is just put them outside on a fairly mild day in a kind of protected area. Um, and that way they can get used to UV light, wind, rain, uh, and so on. Still protect them though. Uh, you can gradually extend the time that you leave them outside um, over a few days. And after a, a few days or a week, they'll be ready to go in the ground. Um, 
we generally have a fairly mild climate, so some people skip this step. Um, I usually do go through the process because I've spent weeks trying to grow my seedlings and I just find it easier to um, sort of give them a gradual um, time to get um, used to the outside conditions. Okay, so let's look at the next slide and talk about skipping all of that and buying transplants instead. Um, when you go to the nursery or garden center, you want to look for plants that have vibrant green foliage and nice sturdy stems, and you want to really closely inspect them for pests, disease, weeds, or any other problems. And remember, bigger plants are not always better because they might have been sitting there for a very long time. Um, and they may have rotted roots or um, be root bound, and they're just not a good choice. Um, so look for those young, vigorous plants. It's great if you can buy locally grown plants because they're going to be better adapted to our conditions. And be sure you read the plant tag to make sure it's the right plant for your spot. Okay, so let's move on and talk about the process of transplanting. Whether you buy transplants or whether you are uh, transplanting your own seedlings, the process is the same. Um, you're going to plant the transplants at the same level as they were in the containers. You don't want to bury them too deeply. The one exception would be something like tomato plants that can be buried more deeply because they generate roots along the buried stem. You want to continue to protect your seedlings up to a point. Uh, of course, water them in to settle the soil, remove any air pockets, and make sure those roots are in contact with the soil. Okay, let's look at the next slide. Once you put the seeds out or the transplants out in the garden, keep an eye on weeds because they're going to compete with your plants for everything, water, light, nutrients, and so on. One option is to get out there and pull the weeds. Another option is to put mulch down. Mulch is any material spread over the surface of the soil. And it, it can include organic mulches like um, pine needles, uh, bark, uh, compost, uh, or inorganic mulches are sometimes used. They include things like plastic or rocks. I don't really recommend those because they can keep too much water in the soil and also um, raise the temperature too high. Um, so an organic mulch has the advantage of um, helping to suppress weeds. It helps moderate soil temperature and retains water. It can reduce erosion and compaction. And the organic mulch also will break down and help add nutrients to the soil. Let's look at the next slide to talk a little bit more about maintenance. Uh, we mentioned weeding, adding fertilizer and compost, watering. Other things that you may need to do on an ongoing basis include deadheading. That means that you're pulling or cutting the spent flowers off the flowering plants, and this encourages them to make more flowers. You might need to prune, and of course, you need to keep an eye out for pests and disease. Uh, there's an old proverb that says that the best fertilizer is the gardener's shadow. And the idea is that the more you're out there watching your plants, uh, you can uh, see any problems that might arise, uh, make sure they're getting enough water and fertilizer, and um, nip any problems in the bud quickly. So let's focus now on pests and disease and look at the next slide. Um, one approach, of course, if you see pests, is to reach for the pesticide. Uh, but there is another um, series of methods that you could use called IPM, which stands for Integrated Pest Management. And the goal with IPM is to reduce the pests to a tolerable point because we recognize that we're not going to get rid of everything. Um, but we can get them to the point where we're still getting a good harvest, we still have our flowers, and so on. Now, IPM combines a variety of physical, chemical, biological, and cultural methods to try to control the pests. And I'm going to use the handsome fellow in the photo, uh, which is a hornworm, uh, to illustrate some of these methods. Um, 
what you can do if you see hornworms on your plants, like uh, tomatoes, let's say, uh, is physically pick them off by hand and drown them in a bucket of soapy water or cut them into with your garden shears. I know it sounds pretty draconian, but it works. Um, you could use biological methods. Uh, they are uh, going to uh, have predators that eat them or parasites that lay eggs on them. Um, you could use uh, BT, which is Bacillus thuringiensis. It's a powder typically that you can mix with water and spray on your plants and, and that kills caterpillars and worms. Um, cultural method might be to rototill the soil after harvest that cuts up the pupae and will um, reduce the problem uh, for your next growing season. So to learn more about IPM, there's a link uh, to IPM uh, through um, Texas A&M. And uh, you can learn a lot more about dealing with uh, various kinds of pests using IPM methods. So let's go to the next slide. I do highly recommend that you keep records. Um, you could use a photo album to keep things like seed packets and plant tags. Many gardeners like to have a written journal. Um, I don't like to have all the bits and pieces, so I use my computer to digitize the information and um, have either my own photos or photos from the internet, notes, all the information I might need, um, and record both successes and failures so you can get a good idea of what you might want to do the next year. Um, so let me stop there and see if we have any more questions or have our other master gardeners taken care um, of those? You know, we had a really fun one that I like, and, and we kind of touched on it earlier, but is there a Houston-friendly, foolproof fruit or vegetable to start growing? What would you say is the easiest fruit or veg to, to try to grow here in Houston? Well, that would depend on the season to some extent. Mm -hmm. um, what we often uh, start uh, with young children is we let them grow radishes because radishes oh. sprout very quickly and grow um, and can be harvested usually in about three or four weeks. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you might wait right now, it's a little bit too hot, but in a, about a month or so, you could try some radishes. Um, another plant that's pretty easy to grow because it has nice big seeds um, would be sunflowers. And you get a, a big bang for your buck with sunflowers. Um, there's a lot of different varieties if you don't have a huge space, but um, if you have a nice sunny spot, Sunflowers might be something that would be fun to grow. Okay, excellent. Um, and then we have one over on Houston Master Houston or Harris County Master Gardener's site. Um, please explain again the difference between hummus and compost, and where and when each is beneficial. So that one didn't get a, a, an answer yet. Online. Okay. Well, hummus is what you um, eat with your falafel, but humus, yeah. <laughs> humus, <Sorry>. H-U-M-U-S, <laughs> is the uh, decomposed plant material. So you could start with just a pile of leaves, mm -hmm. compost that, it gets broken down, decomposed a little bit. And then as the process continues, as, as the FBI continues to munch on it and breaks it down more and more, then we get to the point where we call it humus. Excellent. <laughs> I'll, I'll work on my pronunciation That's for the okay. next time. <laughs> and um, to answer one other really quick question, I can do this one, is will the PowerPoint be available after the seminar? Um, we don't have the files for the PowerPoint available, but the actual video itself will be available to watch as long as you need. So you can just queue up the video again and, and, and find the slide that you need there and pause it. And that way we have all the information for you. So I think that's all the new questions we have. We have just a little bit more to go. So if anybody has more questions, now is the time to ask. Go ahead and type them in and we'll uh, finish the rest of the presentation. Okay, let's take a look at the next slide. So we've given you a lot of gardening resources so far, but I wanted to give you this page in particular through Harris County Master Gardeners because it has clickable links. Uh, so let me point out a couple of them. Um, if you click on Texas Master Gardener for Harris County, you'll see that it takes you to the point uh, where you can ask a specific question. Uh, so you can type in your question and one of the master gardeners will research it for you and get back to you with an answer. So that's a great link. Um, others that we can go to are Eggy Horticulture or the uh, Texas AgriLife Extension. Um, and then EarthKind and Texas Super Plants are, or Super Star Plants are good 
resources to go to um, as you're planning your garden because they will give you information about plants that do particularly well in our area. So you can choose plants that have a, a good chance of success. Uh, I see a couple more questions. Uh, both fig trees and lemon trees uh, can grow here quite well. And um, we will have our uh, sale coming up. Uh, not sure of the dates yet. Maybe one of the other master gardeners has those dates. But we do sell um, trees and other um, plants uh, through our sales at um, uh, the Genoa Friendship Garden or also up uh, uh, in the uh, more northern part of the county. Um, and that will be coming up in the first part of next year. Um, and you'll get information about varieties that do really well here. Um, and then I see a question about a fence facing the sun. Um, so eggplants would require full sun uh, in the summer. And anything on the back side? Um, most vegetables are going to need at least four to six hours of sun per day. Uh, the plants that tend to do well in more shade are more leafy. So things like lettuce might do a little bit better if you don't have as much sun. Uh, but uh, probably you'd want shade plants if the area doesn't get much sun at all. Uh, so maybe ferns or something like that would do best in that kind of area. So do we have any other questions? Well, I think, let me see, that looks to be most of what's come in for right now. Let me just check one more page. Okay, uh, Joanne says the fruit tree sale is typically in January or February. So hopefully we have a good fruit and tree sale coming up uh, in a little bit for that one. And, um, oh, that is our thank you slide. Wonderful. So uh, thank you everybody very much for, for joining us. Thank you, Deborah, for a wonderful presentation. Um, if we didn't get to your question, I think we got to them all, but if we didn't, just keep an eye on, on, on the page. The Master Gardeners will come through and answer the questions as they come in. Um, again, you can view all of our old videos uh, throughout the last year uh, on our Facebook page, Harris County Public Library, or on our YouTube page. We have all of them there. And we'll be back next month for on the third Tuesday at 11 o'clock for our next uh, program. So thank you all very much. And we will see you uh, in a month. Thank you so much. Thanks.